By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we've got, in my opinion, two top tier decks going head to head at DadBotCon, the old school magic event held in Utrecht. We're playing according Swedish rules with a lenient reprint policy, so bring out those those revised cards and 4th edition cards and Chronicles, all the cards we love, bring them in. Anyway, um, they're actually not in these decks because we are going to look at a Lion Dip deck piloted by Erwin and he is taking on Juan, our man from Barcelona. And he is bringing on his pink weenie deck and he's had great results with his deck including a beautiful playset of Iron Claw Orcs and I mean, you're just gonna love the deck photo so definitely stick around for that. Now before I go to the deck deck section of this video, I would just like to point out that as always, if you wanna skip the intro, if you wanna skip the deck deck, I know that some of you do, check the description below because there you will find several timestamps one of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the game action. And as for now, we are going to continue with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the deck of Erwin. Let's take a look at his Line Dip Brew. And here we see the deck of Erwin. So as, as you can see, it is a Line Dip deck, right? We've got Savannah Lines, we've got Serenip Afrit, and you know, we've got those usual control suspects, right? We see four Disenchants, four swords, we see four counter spells, two power sinks in this one. We see, I mean, this deck is fully powered. It's just a really, really strong deck. We see those nasty black cards that people just play, just, you know, just those two cards. And of course, I'm talking about Mind Twist and Demonic Tutor. So, you know, for the people that don't know, and I think I can just keep this deck deck really brief because it's, it's such a well-known strategy, right? So, but just for the people that don't know, what you want to do with this deck is just get a Savannah Lines out turn one or maybe Surrender Profit out turn one, which is definitely possible. I mean, he's playing all the Moxen, he's playing the Black Lotus. I mean, he's got everything in this deck, right? So you just want to get one creature out really quickly then you want to defend that creature with your counter magic and you basically want to mow everything away that your opponent is playing out which you actually can do quite easily because you've got four uh, swords of plowshares you've got four disenchant so it's kind of easy to keep control and then you just kill your opponent with one creature maybe you get a second creature out then it goes a little bit faster but that's not even necessary you also have your two side blasts here to kind of finish off you've got your your top end uh, cast which is the two sarah angels so i mean this is just a really really strong deck the blue power is going to give you some card advantage along the lines you also got a brain geyser in here i mean it's just really, really good. And it's just going to be really, really difficult to beat a deck like this, to be honest. And, uh, you know, Erwin has had some great results with this deck in the past. But I do think if there is somebody who can beat him, it is Juan with his pink weenie deck. So let's actually take a look at his deck. And then uh, I'll let you decide who you think is the favorite. And here we see the deck of Juan, so it's pink weenie, right, basically. And of course, pink is because you've got red, you've got white, you kind of mix it, you get this pinkish color, that's where the word pink comes from. Weenie, of course, refers to the smaller creatures that are being played in this deck, although it's actually not that bad. He's got some more cards here on the top end. We do see four Savannah Lines, four Iron Claw Orcs, and of course, the Mistress Factories, right? We also saw those factories in the deck of Erwin, by the way. They're definitely part of the strategies. Remember, you cannot counter a factory. They're harder to kill, if, especially when they're not animated. As soon as you animate them, they're very, very vulnerable. But um, if you time it right, Mistress Factories can definitely be decisive. So in this deck, we see a combination of strategies, right? We see what white and actually red can do quite well. That is play out small creatures and be aggressive. So Savannah Lines and Iron Claw Orcs kind of fit that department. Then we also see the red qual quality, which is of course burn, and burn in, and an aggro strategy, they just go hand in hand, right? Early game, you're gonna try to inflict some damage with your Savannah line and your Iron Claw Orc, and then you've got Bolt Lightning, and uh, uh, sorry, Chain Lightning and Lightning Bolt to kind of deal a lot of damage. We also see a Fireball and a Disintegrate in this deck, so that's quite aggressive. We also see a City in a Bottle main, by the way, so that's gonna be really difficult for Erwin to deal with, because one uh, City in a Bottle can wipe those surrendered Befreets from the board. So that could be pretty devastating for uh, for Erwin here. And I believe that Erwin is also playing with uh, City of Brass. So remember, City in the Bottle is also great as land removal against a lot of opponents. Talking about land removal strategies, we see four Blood Moon. I mean, that is 
absolutely devastating. If we're looking at the list of Ervin, uh, I'm kind of swapping around here, uh, is that Ervin is playing with a lot of duels. He's got two basic planes. He's got two islands. He does have, of course, all the Moxen and the Black Lotus. So it's not like he's dead and buried when a, a, a Blood Moon hits the board, but a Blood Moon is definitely a problem for him. And Juan is playing four main. That's just... Wow, that's really a lot, Juan. Like, I'm personally playing two main at this tournament and two in the sideboard because against certain strategies, the Blood Moon does nothing, you know. Uh, well, nothing, it always does something, even against the mono deck because you have those mazes of if and factories, they're everywhere, right? So it does something, but the impact is quite minimal uh, when you play against certain decks. Now, also here we see that white control package, although it's only playing with three disenchants, uh, three Swords to Plowsiers and one Divine Offering. Now, um, Swords to Plowsiers can be a little bit counterproductive in these strategies. Of course, it's a super good card, but you are giving your opponent life by killing one of their creatures, and you don't really want to do that with this deck, right? This deck loves to race. Um, I really like the inclusion of that one Dragon Whelp. It's pretty cool. It's got an Amy Weber signature there. Perhaps it's an artist proof. Let me know in the comments below, please, Juan, if it's just a regular signed one or if it's also an artist proof. Um, he's got a great collection, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's an AP. Then we also see a, a lovely Granite Gargoyle. Fantastic flavor text. One red and two, I think, is still an underestimated creature. Two, two flyer that you can pump in defense for one red. We also see two Sarah Angels here, and Erwin is also playing with two Sarah Angels. So this is going to be quite a, a, an interesting matchup. I think Juan is definitely the one who's going to play way more aggressive. But remember, that's going to be tough against Erwin because Erwin also has aggressive creatures. I mean, he's got a lot of answers. So actually, this matchup can, can become a very, very close confrontation. If I had to put my money on or Erwin or Juan, I think I would go for Juan because of all the direct damage that he's packing, but I'm not quite sure because when I'm looking just purely at the strength of the cards, for example, you know, Erwin's deck is fully powered, I would say Erwin is the favorite, but I kind of know Juan, I know he, how good he is with this deck. So I, I'm slightly favoring Juan in this matchup, but I, I, yeah, I think it's just really a 50-50, perhaps. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Am I kind of crazy here? Am I just ignoring Erwin's power? And should Erwin be the strong favorite here because he's playing with blue power? Or, you know, is Juan's deck just really, really good? Remember, he's had some top results with this deck. And before we start with the matchup, maybe it's nice to kind of have a moment to enjoy those beautiful Iron Claw Orc Alters, which has the great text, I am the exactly best creature, the effing best creature. I, I love it, man. I know Juan loves these these wacky altars. I guess that's in his Spanish blood. I know in Spain and Italy, they, uh, they love to alter their cards and let their cards be altered, actually, I should say. Anyway, this is the deck of Juan. We looked at the deck of Aravan. That means we're ready for the battle. Let's go to the match. Game number one, here we go. We've got Erwin sitting on the left with his line dip deck, and on the right, we've got Juan with his pink weenie. And we just saw Juan taking a mulligan, so he starts with six cards. Look at this opening by Erwin. I talked about it in the deck deck that his deck can be very explosive with all those moxes in the Black Lotus. He's got a surrender, a free to turn one. Here we see a mox ruby into a soul ring, into a plateau, and there, <laughs> an iron claw orc. I gotta love Juan, man. This is style points all the way. And I have to say, Juan, I'm kind of missing those altars that we saw on your deck photo. I guess you've brought different ones for this tournament. Anyway, um, yeah, he's taking the damage now from the Surrender, dro dropping to 17. There is some glare on the cards, but I'm going to try to uh, to talk you through this. I believe that's a City of Brass on the side of Erwin there above the Mox Emerald. And he just played a Mishra's Factory. And it looks like he's got a lot of options, which is usually a bad sign, right, for Juan. Uh, taking a damage here and tapping an Emerald, playing a Disenchant on the Sol Ring, trying to slow Juan down. I don't think he'll mind too much, to be honest. And he is going to drop to 17 because of the City of Brass damage. And actually, with the City of Brass combined and the damage from the Iron Claw Orc, actually, Juan is dealing more damage than uh, Erwin is, which is quite interesting, right? Of course, now Erwin can block with the Factory, but remember, the Factory still has Summoning Sickness, so it cannot pump itself. And uh, there seems to be some discussion about the amounts of damage that were being dealt. 
But I do think it's correct. And here's two more probably flying in. I don't think that uh, Erwin wants to make this trade. Remember, uh, of course, Gavad is also playing with bolts and with disenchants and with swords. There is a chain lightning on the life total of Erwin as well. And here we can see that super aggressive play by Juan. He really doesn't mind being under pressure. And I think the surrenders are actually helping Juan's game plan here. Odd as it may sound, you know, a turn one surrender defeat against you may sound like a problem. But I think Juan's kind of fine with it. And uh, we now have to see what Erwin is going to do. He's already on 11. If he's going to attack, there will be a swing back of two, of course. Then again, he can use his factory as a blocker also. I really wonder how this is going to unfold. Three cards in hand for Erwin. I believe two cards in hand for Juan. So Erwin does have some card advantage here. We see a Savannah Lion there in his hand. There was a sneak peek. There is an attack. I would definitely just play the Lion. You can always block the line on the Orc. And he decided not to attack with the Factory. Tapping two. There's a Time Walk. Ooh. This is looking really good for Erwin. He's going to take an extra turn. That means he can deal another three points of damage. He's also going to play a Lion. So he could potentially attack for seven next turn. Does mean he's going to leave himself open though. He's on nine. He could also consider just leaving, for example, the Lions or the Factory at bay to block the Iron Claw. There we see a Library of Alexandria. Only one card in hand for Erwin. And it looks like he's going to animate the Factory here. Or not. We'll just have to wait. He's going to attack with the Surrender. He's going to attack with the Lion. So he's just going to deal five points of damage here to Juan. He's going to drop to nine. Either way, this game will be decided very, very quickly. Both players playing very aggressively here. Juan taking card number three. Now he's got slightly more cards, but he has to do something. If he can push the Iron Claw through, and there's two points of damage, there's a disenchant in hand there for Juan. So he's kind of waiting for Erwin to use that factory as a potential blocker. Either way, it's good for Juan. Also, if Erwin decides not to block with it, but to attack with it next turn, he can still cast that Disenchant. Erwin in the tank decides to take the damage, goes to 7. Now he takes the damage, goes to 6. Of course, he can deal 7 damage to Juan this turn. If he can then find the side Blast, it's his game. Although he cannot uh, deal 7 because... Juan has, of course, that disenchant in hand. So it looks like he's going to animate here, take an extra point of damage. Is he going to know he's going to do something else? Demonic Tutor. This is interesting. What is he going to tutor for? I mean, he doesn't have any black mana for a potential mind twist, because that would actually be a pretty good idea. Like, take out those last two cards, just so you know that Juan cannot do anything anymore. He's going to shuffle up. Actually, some a side blast is good. He's probably going to look up a side blast. Although that is risky because that means his life total will get will go to three. This is very interesting. I mean, if he's going to play a side blast, it means he's not going to animate the factory. He's going to attack for five. So he's going to drop to four. I'm expecting a side blast here. There is a side blast. And that's it, right? Yep, that's game two disenchant in hand for Juan. But look at how close Juan got, even though there was this fantastic opener by, by Erwin and even though Juan took a mulligan. So it's, uh, it's one game up for Erwin, but this match is far, far from played out. Both players are going to go into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, and it's one up for Erwin. And there we already see a card from his sideboard there, the COP red that he's probably going to keep, right? This hand looks pretty good in general. So it looks like he's going to keep his hand. And what is Juan going to do? He's probably on the player, starting with the plateau pass turn. So no Savannah Lion for him. That's a bit unfortunate. Again, we see a lot of glare, but I'll talk you through the card. So this is a plateau. Thank you, Juan, for moving that one. But no... Lions for him. I mean, remember, Juan is the aggressive player here. He wants to put early pressure on. 
But as we could see in the previous game, Erwin has got so much jewelry in his deck that he's also quite capable of casting a turn one Surrendip or even a bigger creature. So now it's up to Erwin to see what he's going to do. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank trying to think of the perfect opener. I did see a Mox Sapphire in his hand. Okay, so there we go, playing out a Scrubland. Playing out a Mox Sapphire and a COP Red. Turn one. So this is going to make it really difficult here for Juan. Of course, Juan is playing with Disenchants. Playing a second land and just passing turn here. So no Iron Claw Orc for him. Is he perhaps keeping a Disenchant in hand on the end step of Erwin here to take care of that COP Red? And this is always the great thing when you play with white in your deck as well. You know you've got access to swords and to disenchants, which is really, really nice. There we see a Mistress Factory, a pass turn. There we see a Blood Moon. Now this is interesting because Blood Moon is really problematic for Erwin. Because now he only has kind of the Moxen. Ooh, there is a blue Elemental Blast. That's just perfect for Erwin. Of course, a card coming in from the sideboard. Perfect answer. And is Erwin, I mean, if he has all the answers, obviously he's going to win. If he wants to, he can swing in for two damage with the factory, but maybe he's got better options. Playing an underground C. Tapping three here. No, he's actually just going to attack here. Animating the factory. So Juan is going to drop. It seems he's 17. Not quite sure where that earlier damage then came from. Perhaps I missed something, but it seems to me that he should just be on uh, on 18. Oh, of course, he took a, perhaps a mana burn damage. No, he did not, and they're not playing mana burn at this format. So I'm not quite sure where the damage came from. Perhaps I'm missing something. Anyway, he's playing a Mishra's Factory and passing turn. And I have to say, Juan is already quite in a, in a difficult package here. This is not what he wants to do. He wants to put early pressure on the board. This is not really his game. There we see a basic island from Erwin. Remember, Erwin also plays a lot of counter magic. So I just really wonder what his follow-up play will be. He's got four mana on the board now. Remember, he's also playing with Sarah Angels, but he doesn't have double white at the moment and he doesn't have five mana, but perhaps next turn he can start playing an Angel. He is passing turn here, not attacking with the factory, not offering the trade to Juan, Juan playing a plateau here. He's got five mana as well, also plays with Sarah Angels. That's kind of his top end. But does he want to play that out? Remember, you know, um, Erwin is playing with four counter spells and a mana drain and two power sinks. So if he's going to play out a big creature, it's probably going to get countered. And this is something that, uh, that Juan knows for sure. I mean, another thing he could do is, is kind of try to attack with his factory to lure Erwin out, out in activating his own factory and then perhaps playing a disenchant on it. Tapping three. Are we going to see another Blood Moon here? Remember, he's playing four Blood Moon. There's another Blood Moon. Are we going to see a counterspell here? We saw a blue Elemental Blast earlier in the game. I mean, Blood Moon is still a huge problem for Erwin. There we see a Power Sink. So tapping here. And now he's got to tap everything. In response, he plays a Divine Offering on the Mox. I wonder if uh, Juan has even more uh, Blood Moons in hand. And for Juan, this is not really a bad scenario because, I mean, he's traded his Blood Moons for Counterspell, so that could be worse. There we see a City of Brass with a lot of glare on it, but it is a City of Brass. And this is definitely a much more controlling game compared to game number one. There we see a Savannah line hitting the board. And this is also a little bit what the line dip player wants to do, right? Play one or two creatures and just control the board with the white control package of Disenchants and Swords and counter everything away that's a threat. Here we see an attack for two, so Juan's going to drop to 15 here. There's a Plains. There we see a Sarah Angel. So after he lured out that counter spell, he's going to take the risk. And now he's got to be lucky. If he's unlucky, we're going to see a counter spell. If, he, if he's lucky, or maybe we're going to see a Swords. 
taking a damage and there is a sword to plowshares. So we just have a lot of answers here, of course, in the deck of Erwin. Juan's going up to 19 and a pass turn. It's looking really, really good for Erwin here. He's kind of playing his control game. He's got pressure on the board. I'm expecting him to attack for four here. You know, worst case scenario, he's going to lose that factory to a bolt or a disenchant. But, I mean, I think it's worth it. But he's not doing it. He's, he's keeping it safe. Wants to keep his factory. And maybe that's a better decision. Of course, Erwin knows what he has in hand. I do not. He's got five mana. And we see Juan, who's now on 17. Erwin a little bit in the tank here. Does that mean that he's got something big to play out? No, he's just passing turn. Two cards in hand for him. Also two cards for Juan. Now drawing card number three. There we see a red elemental blast. That is kind of nice. That means he can protect something else that he may want to play out. What else is in that hand, I believe? Is that a Wheel of Fortune? That is quite interesting. Wheel is very risky. Oh, we see a balance there. That balance could be quite useful for Juan. He's just got to wait for Erwin to commit a little bit more to the board. But I wonder if he's actually going to do that. There we see an attack. There we see an activation. There is a disenchant. He's going to lose the factory here. And perhaps he doesn't mind as much at losing a land because he's got that balance in hand. Only one card left for Erwin. And Juan is now on 15. He's found that Iron Claw Orc, it seems. So that could be good kind of for defense against the Savannah line. Oh no, of course, Iron Claw Orc cannot block a creature of power greater than one. Sorry, I forgot. Okay, forget what I said. <laughs> Using Iron Claw Orc as a blocker is a ridiculous idea anyway. It is an aggressive creature. It wants to attack. I just love the fact that Juan is playing with the full playset of those guys. It is. He's got a difficult hand, you know. I know this. these hands where you've got end balance and... Uh, a Wheel of Fortune in hand. That's always difficult. Although I'm still not quite sure if it is a Wheel of Fortune. It's hard to see. Perhaps I'm mistaken. I did really spot that balance and that Iron Claw Orc. There we see the balance. Interesting. So he's going to play it. And no counter spell. So he's going to lose his Elemental Blast. And it seems he's discarding his Wheel of Fortune as well. Does that mean he's then going to play the Iron Claw Orc? Or did he discard the Iron Claw Orc? It's kind of hard to tell. It's kind of blurry. I think it's maybe one red and one, right? I mean, the card underneath the red Elemental Blast. Anyway, let's first focus on the game. We see an attack for two here by Erwin. So Juan's going to drop to 13. There we see a strip mine. And again, one card in hand for Erwin here. I would love to see Wheel of Fortune in this game. That would be so funny and so interesting. It's always great to see a wheel in the middle of a game. There's the Wheel of Fortune. Yes. There is the wheel. And now I'm hoping that I'm not going to see a counter spell. Swords is gone. Brain Geyser is gone for Erwin. Oh, what a good decision by Juan. Brain guys are gone. That's huge. And now Juan's got a full grip of cards. Of course, Erwin has two. But at least he can build up. So playing a Pearl, playing a Hammerheim. Playing, of course, an Iron Claw Orc. What else? Tapping two more for another Iron Claw Orc? No, he's keeping it untapped, it seems. Perhaps he wants to keep mana open for Swords and Disenchants. And, uh... Apparently, they're discussing the mighty power of the Iron Claw. And are we going to now see he's tapping another one? We're going to see a Savannah Alliance. Now, it could be interesting for Erwin here to actually strip the open plateau just to ensure that uh, Juan cannot respawn next uh, turn with, for example, a Red Elemental Blast or Swords to anything that he may want to play out. 
that would definitely be a consideration. Okay, forget about it. Juan stepping out anyway. He's just putting all his marbles on the board here. Double Savannah Lines, Iron Claw Orc. So only two cards left in hand for Juan. And um, yeah, I wonder here if Juan can still kind of make it because now Erwin has a full hand. He's got eight cards in hand. Unfortunately, he's sliding his uh, his factory out of screen here. That's a bit unfortunate, but there is another factory. He's playing a second one out. And uh, tapping the island here. Oh, Ancestral Recall. Yeah, this is just brutal. And I think that Erwin is going to win this one. We're not there yet, of course, but I mean, it's, it's, this is really slipping away from Juan. You kind of have to be lucky with those Wheel of Fortune plays. And he's only got two cards in hand, already played out his balance. So, Erevin, is he going to play out even more? Tap two. Oh, there's a time walk. That is devastating. So, we see Ancestral Recall and a time walk being cast after that Willy Fortune of Juan. And that's just too much power to deal with, I'm afraid, for Juan. So, he's going to untap. And if he can now find a big creature, now he's got three Mistress Factories on the board. Remember, one of those is out of the, the screen. There we see some random cards, by the way. There, they've got nothing to do with this match, just to clarify. And I think, yeah, if you're Ervin, I would just probably just attack with one factory. You can pump it with two other factories, making it a four-four. Looks like he's gonna play out even more. So he's in his extra turn that he took with the time walk. I guess the only positive thing for Juan here is that, you know, he's not been able to deal any damage to him. He's still on 13. Oh, this is just, this just keeps getting worse and worse for Juan. We see a Chaos Orb. There's actually not really a good target here for Erwin to, to flip on. So he's just passing turn. Interesting. I would have thought that maybe he wanted to attack here with the factory. Remember, Juan was completely tapped out. He's got three Mishra's factories. He could have attacked with one, pump it to a 4-4 if need be, and say to Juan, you know what? If you want to trade it, it's going to cost you two Savannah Lines, which seems like a really bad trade for Juan. And we see Juan here going through his cards. He's kind of restless, deciding just to attack with everything. Does that mean that Juan has perhaps a bolt and disenchant in hand that he can deal with some creatures? What I like about this move is that, you know, you're forcing your opponent now to really start thinking deep. You're making it difficult for your opponent. And Erwin kind of chose this passive route, right, because he didn't attack earlier. So he's showing right now he's going to flip on a lion. He's going to hit a lion. I think that's a good trade for Juan, a lion for Chaos Orb. Now, what is he going to do next? He can, of course, animate the factories. They can tap and pump themselves, which would make two pretty good blocks. But, of course, it's dangerous that Juan will respond with a disenchant. So he's going to animate the factory. He's going to pump it to 3-3. Three, three. He's going to block the Savannah Lines with it. What is he going to do with our friend the Iron Claw? Yeah, he's going to block it with the other factory. Now, are we going to see a response? There is a fireball. That is quite interesting. So he's going to fireball all the creatures away. <laughs> I love this move. Remember, that they've, they've taken damage. Oh, there's a counterspell. Are we going to see a red elemental blast here? I hope so. Oh, no red elemental blast. That is unfortunate. That is very unfortunate. Okay, he didn't block the other Iron Claw, it seems. But, oh man, that is unfortunate. I really like the idea of Juan here. He was like, okay, I'm going to sacrifice my lion, but then I've dealt enough damage that I can play a fireball that can easily take away two creatures on the side of my opponent's board. Unfortunately for him, it didn't work out. There was that counter spell. And I mean, you know, if you're Juan in this position, you just need that little bit of luck to get back into it. But the luck is just not coming. 
There is more tappity tap tap. Are we now going to see? No, he's just attacking with three Mishra's factories and a Savannah line. We see a Swords on one of the factories. That means he's going to take six points of damage. And he's going to drop to seven. It's looking really bad for Juan here. I don't think he's going to survive. He's in top deck mode and already played out his balance. And again, this shows the power of factory, right? Balance is not really great against Mishra's factories. There we see a counter spell on the Savannah lines. Juan's like, are you kidding me, dude? Are you kidding me? And now, you know, I know that I said in the deck tech section that I think Juan is a favorite. That's just because I know how good he is with this deck. But here we can see just the power of this line dip brew, right? I mean, Juan just gets blown away by the line dip deck. And I think I think that turn with Time Walk Ancestral Recall was definitely decisive in this in this game number two. And like I said, with the Wheel of Fortune, you gotta have a little bit of luck. I mean, he discarded the Brain Geyser with the wheel, which was great, but then, you know, the, the cards that Erwin found, they were just too good to be true. And I think he's now gonna swing in with eight, and that's probably the game. No cards in hand for Juan. So this is it, right? He's gonna animate. Or does he want to prolong this match and do something silly? No, he's gonna attack here. He's actually gonna put him on one. And what is he going to do next? I mean, that is interesting. I think, oh, of course, he doesn't have that other factory anymore. So last turn for Juan. What is he gonna find? A basic planes. Okay, and that's it, it's all over. So Juan is taking this one. <laughs> He's not happy. He's like, give me all your cards, whatever, man. Anyway, great victory for Erwin here. A clean sweep and uh, what a great match. And I just have to say, I love those Iron Claw Orcs on your side of the table, Juan. And uh, what a match both of you played. Thank you very much for uh, showing your skills right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And that is the episode for today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I did. I'm always hoping for like a three game thriller, but I guess the line dip deck was just too strong today. Now, if you enjoyed these matches, please check back with us next time because then we have more action from DadBotCon. Here you can see the two decks that we're going to see in the next episode. Titania's song is going to take on, on a mono green build. So that's gonna be pretty uh, interesting. We've got a control strategy versus a classic aggro strategy. And who's gonna win it? We'll have to see that in the next episode. So make sure that you subscribe to Timmy Talks so that you stay uh, ahead of the game and that you know when new videos are being published right here on Timmy Talks. And before you go, there's just one thing that I'd like to tell you and that I'd like to ask from you. Timmy Talks also has a Patreon program and that is a great way to support the channel. So if you like and enjoy the content that I make, please consider becoming a patron of the channel. It already starts with $1 a month. You can see the Patreon page here in the background. I'll have an info card popping up right now and you can click that info card to find out all the ins and outs of joining Timmy Talks on Patreon and I would really, really appreciate it because with your money I can help keeping the channel afloat. There are some nice perks when you join the Patreon program. Uh, one of them is that your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. We're almost at the end scroll and also that you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord and all the Timmy Talks events uh, that I organize every couple of months. So if you enjoy that stuff, have a look on the Timmy Talks Patreon page and who knows, maybe it is something for you and I'll see you there again. For now, thank you very much for watching and let's take a look at our amazing, fantastic, wunderbar patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Let's go to the end scroll.